In today's episode, I'm sitting with an incredible friend of mine, but also a dominant force in the real estate space. We're going to learn a lot. I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to be taking a lot of notes, so you should be taking a lot of notes. Uh, this is going to be for everybody who is a real estate agent, wants to be a real estate investor, is a real estate investor, wants to get into home building, development, or anything uh, uh, as such. So anybody, anybody that you know, again, who's looking to get into real estate to any capacity, the people, uh, this man next to me is going to revolutionize the way you look at real estate investing. He's definitely helped me a lot with a couple of deals that I've been looking at. So I appreciate him a lot. Um, we're going to get started in T minus 60 seconds. So again, if you're on the Facebook live, if you're on the Facebook live right now, I want you to comment down below any questions that you have about building a real estate business, about investing in real estate, about building, uh, about development, redevelopment, all right, we're going to kick this thing off. So again, just I got some rules and regulations for this, this podcast today. If you guys have any questions, comments, or anything like that, make sure you put it down below in the live chat. And for those of you listening on the Zoom call, make sure you're putting them in the chat. We'll make sure we get to you at the very end. Uh, again, knowledge without implementation is just, is just really entertainment. So again, if you guys are listening to this live, uh, or if you guys are watching this on YouTube or any, uh, any channels or platforms there afterwards, make sure you take a lot of notes and make sure you take a lot of action. Uh, again, if you have any questions or anything like that, and you're watching this later on, make sure you comment it in, uh, put it in the comment section below. I'll make sure to reach out to you later on and make sure we get all your, uh, your questions answered. And last but not least, share this out, share this out with people that you love, people that you appreciate and people that you know, you want them to do better. And uh, I assure you, they're going to get a lot out of today's podcast. Cause I know I am as well. So let's dive right into this. Let's introduce my guest. So Josh, not only a dear friend of mine, but he is a dedicated construction technologist of over 17 years with incredible experience in the design world, construction world, redevelopment world. He now he owns dozens of rental properties, an avid developer and home builder. He primarily focuses on luxury custom home building and manages a high-end renovation company uh, throughout Monmouth and Ocean County. Josh, thank you for coming to the show, my friend. I'm excited for today's episode for a lot of reasons. First off, for uh, like we were joking about before, you're like the only person that I know who remembers me from when I was absolutely nothing and just getting my feet wet in the real estate world. So this is going to be really interesting. I was uh, Last year. That was last year, about two months ago. Uh, <laughs> oh, <40 minutes. laughs> a little while back. So we'll dive into that a little bit. But Josh, um, for everyone who's, uh, who's tuning in today, I want to dive into your background before you got into the real estate world. Tell me about how you grew up and how you got to where you are today. Way back growing up. Way back growing up. I want to hear it all. Don't hold anything back, Josh. Uh, I am the product of single mother. I, uh, you know, I, I, my mother was married. My dad left when I was, uh, and my mother remarried. My stepfather, her got divorced when I was like 13. Uh, and then she stayed single until I was in college. And she got remarried to her husband, who she still with now. Um, so you had a single mom growing up? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Where'd you grow up? In Manalapan. In Manalapan, you're a local boy. What'd you say? Said so you're a local boy. Yeah, good old Manalapan, New Jersey. And uh, yeah, I always had a thing for building stuff. Were you a Lego guy like me? Yeah, I had tree houses. Tree houses. Yeah, I used to build um, um, tree houses. And uh, uh, ever since I was two, my dad put a hammer in my hand, and I just always had this talent to build things, and it was always a hobby of mine. And uh wanted to be a cop though so i went to college uh i wanted to get into the dea and i was academically dismissed from school academically dismissed yeah pardon it, too much. is that a, is that a really nice way of saying goodbye? i was kicked out of college, yeah, kicked out of college. Yeah. got it yeah and um, where'd you go to college kane university good old kane for what uh first it was a poli sci crim justice and then uh, I, I got kicked out and started working for a framer. I was framing condo buildings down at the beach in Belmar. And that's how I got into real estate. That's when I got bit by the bug. So you started out in the framing world? Yeah, and I got, uh, got back into college. And just to get a degree so I can get a good job, save my money, and be a real estate developer. That was the idea? That was the plan. I was uh, 20 years old, maybe, working for a framer. I was sitting on a, a, a third story ridge beam, running roof rafters, second block in from the ocean on a 
condo development that the developer was building. I was working for the framer and uprides this guy on his bicycle with these two little kids in, in tow. It's like 10, 11 o'clock in the afternoon. And I, I said to my boss, I said, George, who the hell is that? And he goes, oh, that's the owner of the property. That's, that's the developer. That's who we work for. I said, wow. And right then, I, I, I'm looking at the ocean, three stories up, sitting on a bridge beam, shaking like a leaf because I'm afraid of heights, but whatever. And I said, this is what I want to do, and this is where I want to do it. So I worked my ass off to get back in the college, graduated with honors on some BS communica broadcast communications degree. It's just something that I, I just wanted do. to finish. I wanted to finish. I know I could. It was a breeze for me. Uh, I could do it while I was working full time. I was taking 18 credits and working like 60 hours a week. I get that. Bartending and working for the tech support department of my university. And uh, graduated with honors. Uh, before I even graduated, I got a job in technology for a broker dealer, a trading firm in the city. And uh, they threw a bunch of money at me. And I saved it all. You know, I, I, How old are you at this time? 24. 24. Um, so you're 24, you're working in New York? Mm -hmm. And I would routinely, every weekend, look at a dozen properties in Weehawk in Jersey City, um, West New York, everywhere. It's multifamily buildings, thinking, you know, running cost models on them, thinking I was going to, you know, syndicate a deal. I didn't have any money, but I was going to, people were going to invest in me because apparently I didn't know shit about shit. So why not give somebody who's green all your money to run an investment that they have no idea what they're doing with? Sounds about right. Yeah. So I ran around every weekend, looked at houses, looked at multifamilies, looked at deals, this, but all the while I was saving my money and educating myself. On what, in what, in what way? Just, just the, the sheer fact that I was running a dozen uh, cost models every weekend on these, on these properties, um, you know, running, you know, uh, renovation and, and, and P&L numbers on, on flip houses. And then, you know, I, I bought my first flip, which was going to be one of those, not really a flip, but a flip type of deal. Like it was going to act as my primary residence, but I was going to renovate it and then sell it when I was done. Sure. Um, and it was kind of a tough time in my life. My, my, my dad just passed away and uh, I just left that job that I was at in the city for five years I was there. I went to a different job. So now you're in your late 20s? Uh, 28, 29. And I had left a girl who I was engaged to be married to that I was with since I was 20. So she knew me when I was kind of a screw up and I progressively improved my life while I was with her. And um, I left her right all, all within like a three month period. I bought my first house. I Which was where? In uh, English town. I left that girl that I was with for eight years. I left the job that I was with five years and my dad died. All with, like literally in a three month period. And um, Jeez. yeah, it was a bit upside down. So I was doing all the rentals myself while I was living there. And what should have been a three to six month project turned into three years. And during that three year period, the market corrected. So I didn't sell it. I um, stayed there. It didn't really cost me much. And I continued to look at deals and run models and, you know, save my money. And... I finally pulled the trigger again, 2010, and that was like the perfect time to buy. I was like, that was right at the bottom of the market. Yeah, that's when I, I bought my second deal, and um, that was another flip. It was a restoration of a house, and uh, I, I bought it, sold it within really what was the worst part of the real estate market, and uh, I made my, you know, my percentage points and uh, I regret selling that one, but probably I, would have been worth a pretty penny, right? Now. I regret selling them all. Uh, I, if, yeah, but, you know, if you went back, you would have just kept everything. 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 That's why I, I've changed my model going forward. 
Um, but so I, you know, and then from that point on, I met my wife, uh, bought a piece of property in Belmar, built a house there, uh, which I just sold on the 15th of last month. Um, and I bought a multitude of multifamily properties that I literally I was buying from horrible, horrible properties and gutting them out, turning the luxury rentals to the hipster crowd and uh, did a bunch of that, flipped a bunch of houses, built a bunch of new construction houses. Um, so the last year or two, the last two years, I saw the market margins getting tighter and tighter and tighter prior to COVID. Um, so I, you know, I had the team set up. I, 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 I started a construction company to do customer work to offset the, the lack of um, profitable deals that were out there because now apparently everybody is you know a real estate investor and now the, the customer work has surpassed everything else um, but uh, yeah it, it's been one hell of a ride I, I absolutely I was able to retire from corporate America I was Forty when I retired, it was 2016. So just to clarify, throughout this entire period of time, you were still working a corporate job. Corporate job. I was. I was a pretty senior guy. Well, I, I know. Right? I was traveling all over the world, building mega data centers in, in Japan and Australia. So you're making good good amount of money. Stayed was, at your corporate job. I wasn't making a ton of money. That's awesome. I I worked nonstop seven days a week for like 13 years straight. Jeez. Um, in my corporate life, I had, you know whole bunch of people reporting to me around the world, uh, not including the subcontractors and contractors that, you know, I was responsible for on all these build sites. Um, but yeah, uh, like 13 years in a row, seven, seven days a week. And I said to my wife, I said, uh, who also has a wildly successful career. I said to her, I said, I, I can't, uh, I'm tired. I can't do both anymore. I got to give up one and I don't want to give up the legacy I've created with my business. It's really what I always wanted to do. And she, and this is after, you know, going out to Mellow Park, California to be entertained by Facebook for a job out there. And I told him, no, I'm too close to my dream. I turned down another job for a really successful hedge fund. I said, thank you, but no, thank you. And I, um, I said to my wife, I said, I can't do this anymore. She said, well, why don't you quit BlackRock? That's where I was working. I was like, BlackRock. It's an incredible company. 942nd employee when I was there. The Are you kidding me? No. That's amazing. And I, they hired me to start their data center practice and portfolio group. So I was responsible for their um, purchasing and acquisition of their, their data center sites, their data center spaces, their, their data center uh, pieces. Uh, I was also responsible for their data center construction and engineering, uh, along with another gentleman there. And I was responsible for their data center operations team. So all the guys that worked at the tech sites did that a long time. It's amazing. Um, and I said to my wife, I said, I can't do this anymore. And she's like, just quit BlackRock. I said, I'm going to quit BlackRock. I got a good gig. She said, well, you know, you should have quit five years ago. And it, it dawned on me at that moment during that conversation that I actually had reached the goal that I set out to reach of being able to leave corporate America. Based on your rentals? No, just based on all the business I had going. Uh, like income wise from side income. Yeah. I get and, that. And um, I didn't, I didn't realize I'd reached my goal until she, she said that. And, and it, you know, the transition, you know, she obviously um, had, a, has a career. So, you know, the fact that we, we could live on her income alone, made the decision to, to, to walk away that much easier. So, you know, having, having a partner that you can rely on and depend on sure. um, really is, is the most important thing. I want to dive into a lot of what you said, because I feel like it, it hit home for me a lot. And like, obviously, because I see myself doing a lot of the same stuff. But one of the big things you're saying that um, I give you a lot of credit for is that, again, you took all of your money that you were making for BlackRock and you moved it into real estate. Every dime. Every dime. And not only BlackRock, every, every dime from my first job at ITG from when I worked at Citigroup. You know, I mean, I, 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 I had fun. I traveled. I, you know, I had a bit of a motorcycle addiction. Um, 
you know, I, I, I you're I, still into that or no? No, nah, not since the kids. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I did spend money. I, you know, and when I was single, I didn't, you know, I didn't meet my wife until I was 35, 36. So, you know, I would travel, I would go out and have, I, I had a lot of fun, but I always banked a lot more than I spent. Do you have a rule of thumb when it comes to your money? Rule of thumb. And just in regards to like a percentage you put away or a percentage you spend or anything like that? Yeah, no, I, well, now I spend less than I ever did. My, my business consumes so much capital uh, on a regular basis. I don't have to tell you you're a business owner. Um, but I, I, I really don't spend anything. I leave that up to my wife. She spends. <laughs> I, don't, I don't spend shit. So let's, let's, I want to rewind the clocks a little bit. So when you, were, when you were investing in real estate at the very, very, very beginning, mm -hmm. what were you doing differently then versus what you're doing now? What was I doing differently then? Deals were plentiful. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot, not a lot of people trying to, you know, HGTV wasn't yeah, that big of a was, thing. There was nobody. I went, I went throughout Asbury Park and it was me and maybe a, a very few other people buying stuff. So uh, for people who don't know what Asbury Park is, by the way, Asbury Park was this run downtown, which a part of it still is, a certain quadrant mm -hmm. is, right? And I, you know, obviously there's been a lot of redevelopment in this area over the last, call it decade or so, like never before. Um, but why Asbury? I looked at Long Branch and I personally, and I looked at Long Branch during the downturn and I looked at Long Branch first and it was a lot of multifamilies. A majority of, of, of those properties were renter based, right? Yep. So it's a huge rental population, and during the downturn, a lot of these a lot of these families that were the, the rental population at the time were um, in the trades. So when the economy went south, there was a ton of vacancies back then. In, in Long Branch. Yes. And so, so what can you real quick? What can we learn from that when we're looking at multifamilies? Us, the follower, people listening. Like, what can people learn? Well, now from? it's tricky. Because we are in such an inflationary period, everything's inflated, hyperinflated. Uh, you know, I don't know if the media reports it as, as much as they should be, but you know, things are, are so expensive, uh, you know, more so now than they ever were, even, even from nine months ago. Um, these rents that everybody is doing their models on, Henry, are not going to last. We are, in a, we are in a massive population migration that we've never seen before and i think and I, you know, i'm just a i'm just a old happy little guy running a business so what do i know um but i think people have short memories they forget that his, what happened before they forget that there was a pandemic and they forget that they left the city for a reason and they you know, so I think, I think people will eventually want to go back into the city or, or, or be in the cities. And I think, um, you know, I think this, this, this migration, you know, showed everybody that everybody can work from home. I'm sorry. But I don't think the rents are going to be as elevated as they currently are. I think they will eventually go down. We've seen that historically. Rents go up, rents go down. And I agree. I think everybody that is buying and supporting these huge you know, purchase prices based on higher rents, yep. that the higher rents really aren't, they're not based on anything. So when I would go and buy a dilapidated property, I would, I would renovate it and jack the rent up, you know, you know. After the vacancy, I would renovate and, and increase the rent. I've created value there. Yeah, I get that. I've done something that to the property that um, caused me to be able to get more rent. Um, people are getting rents now that just because of supply and demand issue. I agree with that. So when that supply increases and that demand goes drops down. Yep. So question for you. All right. So let's, let's unpack this because I, I agree with you hundred percent. So I do believe that these luxury buildings that are going up on these ridiculous models of getting 
$3,000 for a one bedroom is just astronomical and I don't think is a long-term play. No. So where are most of your rents now price-wise? I was never one of those landlords to significantly increase my rents for multiple reasons. One, um, it won't hold up in landlord tenant court. If you, you know, uh, I, I would think that any judge in New Jersey landlord tenant court that you know, you know, rents cannot be unreasonably increased, right? That's the per per year. You're saying, yeah, yeah. So on a renewal, you cannot unreasonably increase the rent. And I think any any judge in in the New Jersey, especially tenant in New court, Jersey. will deem maybe ten percent, you know as the cap of what's reasonable. Um, but, you know. Which is still a lot better than other areas. I mean. They, yeah. So, you know, I've never, you know, it, to me, having a, and I screen very heavily, having a quality tenant that takes care of your property, that is going to stay three, four years um, and pay you your rent, because that's what, oh, ultimately that's what you want, right? Exactly. Um, that to me is more important than a few extra points on an increase year over year. So if my taxes go up, if my insurance goes up, maybe I'll increase three, four, five percent. That's typically it. Anything, anything. So an average rent right now is how much for you? Uh, for a two bedroom, probably nine fifty a thousand a month on two. So, but you know, nine fifty a thousand a month is super, super, super cheap, especially out here. Yeah, but, but you're don't forget, I, I, I bought these properties for I was buying four families for two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. I get that, but I'm just saying, I just because I want to clarify. I mean, like in this area, we're looking at an average two bedroom of somewhere between fourteen and twenty two hundred, pretty comfortably. No, I'm saying per per bedroom. Oh, per bedroom. I apologize. Bedroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah, per bedroom. So, okay, so uh, yeah, nine fifty, eighteen hundred, okay. two thousand. Okay, sounds about right. a lot. Of, you know, those market. are the models that I run on. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very comfortable rent. And then one bedrooms are where? Uh, anywhere from fourteen. I've got uh, got a one bedroom now. It's uh, it's eighteen hundred. So there we go. But you know, it, they're nice place. Granite countertops. Sure. Custom cabinets. Wood burning fireplace. I love that. Uh, by the beach. Yeah, it really can't beat that. So, okay. So then let's, let's start. I want to really bring a lot of value to these people. Cause I mean, look, I'm, I'm already learning a lot here. So with it, you know, I know, I know you brought up the hyperinflationary area that or era that we're in right now, which I agree with you. Oh, just wait. Oh, I, I, I know. I mean, this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, for a lot of you guys watching, you know, and you're not paying attention to the fact that this just can't continue for an endless period of time. I mean, don't get me wrong. This, this is going to last quite some time. I don't think it's going to flip a switch tomorrow. Um, I do believe within the next 24 months, we are in for something. We're in for a rude awakening, that's for sure. Uh, and you need to be prepared. I mean, one thing that I learned, I mean, Josh knew from when I was, you know, a, you know, a, a young lad in the business world. And, uh, you know, I probably did, knowing me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, listen, the, what, what we're trying to say is that, listen, now, just like Josh was saying in his past, save some money, save some cash. Oh. Stop investing it into crap stuff like crypto and all this other stuff. You are going to regret it. I I, I don't, you know, I'm an old, old guy, so I'm not hip on what all the young folks are doing. But I, I can only tell you what worked for me. And, you know, you see a lot of these programs, you know, get rich, buying property, no money down. I, I, I don't know what business they're in, but I always needed a massive amount of capital to buy stuff. Real estate. I, I just did a video on that. And I was talking about how the only way you can really do no money down is if you find somebody with the money. So it may not be your money down, but it's somebody's money down. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it's real estate is a money hungry business, money hungry. And you need to feed that machine. Absolutely. And, you know, especially if, if you're buying multifamilies or, or even a single family rental, if you're buying rentals, I, I, I <laughs> you're going to find this funny to date to date, to present time, for when I started buying rentals, to present time, Yep. I've never taken income from that business. So you just put Ten all years, of it back into it? I have operations accounts set up for each, 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 each rental is in itself a business. Agreed. 
it's, it's an LLC. Yep. Each LLC has a operating checking account. So you have a different LLC for every property. Okay. Each LLC has, a, has an operating account. And there, there's different schools of thoughts of, of the right way to do that. Do that, some people don't, blah, blah, blah. But what worked for me is treating each building as a, as a separate business. Uh, agreed. And each business has a business checking account. I have yet, money goes in. And you don't move it. And it goes out for expenses. It doesn't go out for income. Interesting. So I'm at the point now where I said to my wife, I don't really need to have all this money in these accounts. I could start taking this stuff as income now. So I'm, for the first time, 10 years on some of them, I'm actually going to take income from these properties. Wow. But so my advice to you, and I think I told you this the other day, have six months of expenses in that account in your property operating account for that property. And just to find that for people listening. So if you're buying, if I'm buying a property, which well, I'm going to use my example, I'm buying a four family right now. Um, and purchase price is six, six fifty five. Mm-hmm. Taxes are about 8,000 mm-hmm. and between insur- all insurances, flood insurance, everything else, it's probably going to cost me another 6,000 or so. And then figure 16% of gross annual rents for maintenance. Okay. So, so 16% on 70,000. So that's 10. That's, Call 10K. That's three, no, that's seven. So, so yeah, 10K. Yep. So 10K plus your eight for insur- for, for taxes. So that's 18. And then insurance and is about four or five. Yeah, total plus five. So what's the math on that? 22? Okay. Yeah, 22, 23. All right, so you, Call it 2,000 a month. If it were me, I would lock up twelve to $15,000 in that operating account before I ever took a nine on that property. 100%. And everybody that I tell this to, well, I was too conservative. Oh, no, what are you doing that for? And guess what just happened in this state? There is an eviction moratorium. People are legally allowed not to pay their rent, and the landlord is being held hostage. Bag. Yep, I right? agree. And, you know, right now we're 430 days into this thing, right? So, yep. you know, for those people that didn't, have a hold back or didn't hold back enough and they're not getting their rents. I mean, they're screwed. I, I think this is a great lesson to learn for a lot of people and just starting business in general. And especially because a lot of, you know, look, I think that there's a lot of younger people who are getting into the business world right now. And again, they might not have a lot of capital, but again, if you're going to start a business and you don't have a lot of capital, that should, you know, you need, that's why you need to live frugally and stack cash away. I'm going to give you a And this is how I live my life. I still live my life. Like this. I can go out, I can buy a boat, I can buy a Porsche, I can buy this, I can buy that. I don't. My wife thinks I'm crazy. She's like, oh, live life, be happy, enjoy the money while well, you can, blah, blah, blah. But now I've got kids. It's not about that. It's about me leaving them a legacy. And I had to work at a job um, for, you know, do something for 17 years that I, I didn't have passion for. So I was literally just my soul sucking out of my body. 17 years to reach this goal and I do that so my kids can just do whatever makes them happy and not have to worry about how much money they make. but there's something called delayed gratification and anybody that wants to be successful at what they do and be able to support themselves doing what makes them happy they're going to need to practice some form of delayed gratification. And the, the, the biggest example of that is you flip a house, blah, blah, blah. After you pay your taxes, you make 70 grand. Oh, let me go lease that M3. A lot of people do that. For me, I'll get the M3 later on. Let me go flip that into a something that produces regular cash flow. So it's just a constant lifelong process of delayed gratification. I believe in that, you know, and, and uh, it's taken me a long time to see it that way because I definitely didn't for a while. You, you had bought that um, suit of the Audi. Cherokee or something. Was it the Audi? Then I bought an Audi. It was a Cherokee, then an Audi. Yeah, what, I, I think I, I busted your chops on both of those. He, he continues to bust my yeah, chops. I, He's I, my... I said, what are you doing? I said, you don't need that shit. <laughs> 
<laughs> Listen, if, I, if, 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 I had, right. if I had a dad growing up, <laughs> if my daddy was around. No, but if, if I had somebody there telling me, if, if I had my future self telling my past self, I, my, I would tell myself, don't spend the dime, save it all. I was, even, even though I was, I lived frugally, I, I had a good time, I wouldn't spend it, I wouldn't spend it dying. And I tell my kids that, my kids have piggy banks that are just bursting with money. And um, I tell them, the, the, there's a couple of young guys that work for me, I tell them the same thing. Save your money. Like, my, my, one of my employees is a, a kick-ass musician, he, he's like, oh, I just bought another bass. I'm like, hey, what's wrong? Sorry for Chris. Save your money. You know, my, my other guy, my, one of my other guys, he's uh, just uh, took the plunge and moved in with his girlfriend and uh, actually rented one of my apartments. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's trapped. <laughs> <laughs> he's never getting out of that never again. Never getting out of the fall. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I said, dude, like, don't, don't spend a million dollars on furniture. Go on, on Facebook and buy nice used stuff. People are just giving furniture away that's brand new. Yep. And, and, and save your money and buy two family and offset your expenses. So it, it's... No, I love that. And listen, I mean, for me, I mean, I had to reteach myself how to look at money because I wasn't taught um, how to look at money the right way. I was taught that, you know, you make money, you spend it. Money's a tool. And I've learned now that money is nothing but it's a tool. tool. It's a tool. It's, 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 it's a tool and it's freedom. Yes. It's an opportunity creator. Yeah. So, you know, it, and the biggest thing that, that, that I've learned um, is money begets money. So, so use your money to make more money. Yeah. If you're not buying, it, ask, if you're not buying an asset generator, a money generator, with your money, I think you're blowing and, it on something wrong. And that's the biggest thing that I'm realizing now. You know, I, 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 I spent a lot of time building and selling, renovating and selling, and I regret it. I regret what, it. What would you do differently then? You said, oh, the selling sell part. Sell nothing. So let me, okay, let's break this down because I think there is a massive difference. I'm not a fan of owning single family residences. I used to. Right. I know you did. I, not I, anymore. No. I sold all my singles for the last so, two years. Well, see, like I'm just, I look at single family residential homes really as do. they're very high risk. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I obviously can see that the, the appreciation on them can be way, way different than are a two you, family. Are you Kenny Rogers? Every time, every time somebody speculates on appreciation, it's a gamble. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, things go up, things go down. I agree. Where are you in the cycle when you're buying? You know, that's why it happened last time. Everybody was buying because they oh, we're just gonna we're just gonna hold this for three months. We're gonna sell, sell it. it based on we're gonna do crap, and we're gonna sell it based on appreciation. Well, exactly. Got burned. And they went back. To I agree. With you. And but see, but that's why I'm saying I think single families are are not meant to be bought and owned. I think those are meant to be bought and flipped and built, right. And then multis are being. It, Multis are always better. Yes. And because it, it, you diversify your risk. Agreed. Over, over many units, uh, you take a vacancy and vacancies do come up. Uh, you have the other units to share or cover the expenses. Um, I agree with that. But, you know, I, I have had single family rentals that I've done well on. I also bought them right. Uh, I've gotten out of them and sold them because of that exact reason. I, I don't want the risk of, of, you know, if you take, if you take a, you have a tenant that's just a normal course of, of, of life, uh, vacates, you guys part ways, you have to clean up and, and remarket and get an, you know, get the CEO and, and, and get the tenant in and background checks and this and blah, blah, blah. I mean, if everything were to run perfectly, that's at a minimum a six week period. At a minimum. Yep. Typically, it's probably more like two, two, two months. months. So that's two months of no income. Two months of no income. That's why I always tell every tenant that I that I walk through, that I when I when I'm uh, interviewing, I always say, "How long do you plan on staying?" Oh, we you know we we're, we're just going to be here twelve months. Next. 
because as a landlord, besides your taxes and insurance, your biggest expense are your vacancies. I mean, because if you're getting $2,000 a month and, you, and you're vacant for two and a half months, that's $5,000 right there. Yeah, and maybe six because now they can't start again. Exactly. Yep. So, you know, single family rentals, I did well on. I made money. But if you do it again, you go straight to multis. Well, I'm doing it again. Well, I meant like and it's only multis from the beginning. Yeah, yeah it's all it's all, unless you know it's on a double or triple lot, and you know in the future I have plans to Develop subdivide it. the lot and, and build a couple houses, and then you know the rents on this single family home are going to cover or you know cover or 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 partially cover those expenses until I'm ready to do that. I get that. Yeah, there's there's it's not just a, a blanket statement of never. It's it depends on the scenario. But I typically, if it's just to make money on rent, no, I won't, I won't, I won't rent a single family. I love that. And that's why, like, for me, I'm even looking at it like I only want to be picking up either, no matter what, I want to obviously be buying it at the right price where I can buy it, renovate it, and then refinance 100% of my money out is my goal, right? That's typically my number because then my cash and cash returns are a lot higher. And I just try to put it in a good position for when I refine. I get locked into a very good rate. Um, that's just Can a, you do that? Yes. Yes. I mean, all of my deals I'm finding off market. I mean, this one happened to be on the market and I just don't think they know what they have. Um, truthfully, call I call you about deals every now and again. No. It's the shit you don't want. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the sloppy seconds. It's sloppy seconds. That's, yeah. that's exactly what that is. <laughs> you know, I have the money to buy this, but I really didn't like this deal. So I'm just going to He's reiterating an exact conversation we had recently. <laughs> Listen, so, I, and again, I'm asking for myself, what are, um, what are some quick, I guess, uh, you can even say mistakes, mistakes or tips, it doesn't matter which way you go on this, as a landlord that you would be telling your, uh, you know, your younger self when you first got started, I wish I knew these things when I was a landlord, just getting started. Don't make these mistakes or make sure I do this when I'm vetting tenants or when I'm doing certain things. I over-improved, you know, I don't know what you did. I have screened, I screen so heavily. I turn down 95% of tenants that other landlords would go to. I do that on purpose. Guess who's getting their rent checks every month right now? I have been not only since this entire pandemic started. So you've been 100%? 100%. That's amazing. What do you, what do you attribute that to? I, I know you're saying vetting, but I, specifically. I, I, I make sure I verify employment. I verify income. I have income to 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 rent ratios that I do not deviate from. I what is that? Well, you know the, the typical rule of thumb is three you know, x thirty percent, right? So All right, yeah, that's thirty, just 30 percent of um, gross rent. So if it's two thousand, they got to be making six ish. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, so. I don't deviate from those things. I check people's backgrounds. I check, I, I, I require talking to um, prior landlords because, you know, everybody will hand you their current landlord's information. Like, oh yeah, call. I guess what, if, you, if you're that current landlord, you got a problematic tenant, you call, what are you going to say to the guy that's potentially going to- They're great. Yeah, dissolve you. You, you should totally problem. take my oh, annoying no, they're, tenant. They're, they're fantastic. Meanwhile, the, the tenant's a-, a, a you know, a, a meth addict that's, you know, just burned down half the unit and hasn't been paying them rent for two years. You know, oh no, they're fantastic. Best tenants ever. They're so clean and neat. Pay the rent on time. It's the previous land. And people's characteristics, their, their income might change. Their, their job status might change and everybody falls on hard times at some point in your life. How you handle those hard times is completely different. You know, good quality people are open and honest about, hey, I'm gonna be late. I've got this issue, I've got that issue. Can we work this out? And then you have the people that there's no phone calls, the place is a mess, they're partying all the time, affecting other tenants, and they're not working and they're not paying your rent. So, you know, but it, it, the, the, the previous landlords are really gonna tell you the truth. So, okay, so again, for those of you who are listening in today, we're gonna to give you a couple of tips. So number one, screen like no tomorrow and make sure uh, they, they at least meet the 30% rule, which again, they make, uh, call it three times and if minimum. And if they're questionable, 
They're probably yeah. questionable. You shouldn't take bank statements. Oh, well, about the income? Ask for bank statements. So again, if you're questioning the income, you can look at the ask for bank statements to prove it. Well, uh, you're 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 going to get um, if they're W two employees, you're going to get the four most recent pay stubs. Yes. Right? So take four most yeah. recent pay stubs. Um, yeah. And if they're self employed, you want to see their taxes. You want to see their bank statements. You want to see how much money they have in the bank. You know, if you got somebody signing up for twenty five hundred dollars a month apartment, that you know, Maybe. is 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 making the bare minimum to be able to rent that. So seventy five hundred has a thousand dollars a month in the bank or a thousand dollars in the bank yeah it's just not it's not they're, they're too close to the wire um you know most the reason why i lose most of my tenants is because they they buy houses so you know they have money in the bank to buy a house or they're saving money to buy a house and some of my tenants even bought my houses it's awesome um my last single family rental that I, that I just sold um, was on December of 2020. Sold it to my tenant. It's the one on, are they talking? No, somebody else I was talking to. Um, actually, Ellen sold me that house for $109,000. I remember that house. Yeah, the tenant just bought it. Well, they paid. It's, it's public record, so uh, 270. It's a nice, that's a nice uh, long-term. I gave it to him for a 30%, 30000 $30, dollars discount. I could have got three hundred all day long for that house. I, I bought it for a hundred and nine. I renovated it for thirty five, forty, whatever it was. Rented it out to them. They were my only tenant there. For I how long? When did I buy that? Two thousand fourteen. Fourteen, fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. I was making seven hundred dollars a month on it, free and clear every month. It's amazing. So, okay, so, and again, just to reiterate, reiterate for everyone listening here today. So when you're buying investment properties, again, we talked about vetting them. Uh, in mostly, uh, I guess, when it comes to, um, a lot of this is income. You want to vet a lot of their income and, and make sure that, score. yeah, don't, uh, well, credit score is definitely a huge thing. Do you have a number that you always look at? 650 is the minimum. 3X the income. So again, if you're renting for 2,000, they have to be making six. If they're rented for 1,500, you gotta be making 4,500. Don't be afraid to ever call the previous landlords and not just the, the, most, like the most current, but the one before that as well. I think that's a really powerful point because again, think about it, their current landlord, if, they're, if that is a bad tenant, that, that current landlord is gonna be like, yeah, they're a great tenant. You should totally take them off my hands right now. That would be fantastic. So make sure you're calling the, te- the, the multiple, uh, multiple landlords, just not the most recent, I like that. What about in regards to renovations? Because I know that you're you're the kind of guy where I think very similar to you. Where I think making them gorgeous. I do know. make them gorgeous. Um, and then you charge a fair rent, which I think makes I sense. Charge, I charge market rent. Yeah. Um, but knowing that we could probably get more. Uh, two quick minutes is better than still buying a rent. Yeah, I get that. So, um, especially with a good tenant. I'll take I'll, I'll, I'll take less money in a good tenant. Uh, I'll do pay well. over over. More money and questions. I get that. Um, it's, it's the turtle and the rabbit, right? You're gonna make more money on the turtle than you are on the rabbit. The rabbit's gonna burn out. But see, like everyone's, you know, especially because I feel like a lot of the people in my life, um, which even I experienced a lot for my life, which is I made a lot of money very, very young, and I didn't know how to manage it. So I ended up buying a lot of stupid stuff, which I'm currently probably still wearing right now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but look, I learned, I learned from my mistakes and now that I, you know, I've been a little bit smarter, uh, got well, look in your business, you have to your, yeah. your customer case, I, I walk around the office every day, um, but in your business, you know, you, you, you're, you, you have to dress the part, right? But there, there's a within reason. There's a $50 belt, then there's a $950 belt and you definitely don't need the 950. You know. I made that mistake several times over. So Listen, I, I, one other thing I wanted to get into. So for a lot of people listening here today, a lot of people are real estate agents, okay? And I think one thing that real estate agents never pay attention to is their money. And they sell properties all day long, but they never learn about investing in it. What's the old, old adage? Your real estate broker is broken for you. Seriously. It's and a pretty common saying. I, you know, I, 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 all the real estate agents that I, that I discuss or have relationships with every one of them is, is an investor every one of them is wildly successful it's amazing um, you know, i do have my real estate license i, I don't practice it it's not my core i remember company. when you got that yeah it's not my core competency I, I bought it because i wanted to get into houses with lock boxes right to, to look at them and hit the market 
So you, just to clarify, you don't need a license doing what you're doing, but you got it because you want to just have a little bit more access to things. Correct. Got it. So, all right, let's talk real quick. Cause again, I want to bring a lot of value to realtors here on the phone call. If you are a real estate agent and obviously first step first is number one, get your money right. Mm -hmm. That's number one. If you're not getting your money right, you know, uh, again, which is saving a lot of money, paying a decent amount of money in your taxes every year. Uh, I do mean a fair amount because you need to be able to qualify for properties. You know, I feel like a lot of them just write off every every ten ninety nine for every 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 self employed employee should have a um, tax escrow account. Not a bank. It's just an account that every time you sell a house, take thirty percent of that proceed and dump it into that tax account. So at the end of the year, you don't get hit with this giant tax bill and not have enough money for it. It's just, it's, it's, it's that old adage, pay yourself first. Well, this one is, is prior to that adage. It's pay the IRS first. Yeah. <laughs> pay, pay your partner that we don't, all don't like yeah. first. So take, take 30%, put it in the tax escrow account and take, you know, 30% and put it in your savings account. And then, you know, just play the with the rest, use the rest of the surplus to live. Yeah. So I, uh, I didn't do that at the beginning, but ever since then, I, I have made it a purpose to put it somewhere between 30 and 40%, depending on my cash at the time, into a tax account. So then when the tax time comes, I'm basically giving myself a bonus because typically I have more than enough socked away. Um, so, okay. So number one, get your money right. Again, if you're a real estate agent, you want to earn enough money where you can be saving enough money so that you can put yourself into a position to qualify for real estate. Now, again, this is, I think, where you and I differ a lot. The way I kind of fell into my mentorship when it comes to investing in real estate, they kind of say, you want to have the least amount of money in these deals that still cash flows at a good rate. Yep. And I know that you're a little bit of the opposite, uh, where you want to put down a good amount of money so you have a good amount of equity. I, look, I, I, I'm conservative, right? And for good or for bad, you know, I, I have to be comfortable keeping it out. I get that. Um, I have properties that I own outright cash that I bought in cash and I never pulled money out. Hot pockets like that. Um, pretty much my all of all of my development stuff is cash. Is there any reason why you do that? Outside, I'm just saying, like, what what in you says, like, because I'm looking at it like this with all of your properties. Why would and then obviously I know that now with you know the properties you've recently sold, you might not need the cash as much. But I'm saying if I'm you. I would make sure that every property had a minimum of like a hundred or 150,000, at least a third or at least 50% worth of debt on it where I'm still cash flowing, but that debt now I can go move into other assets. Well, what I do, if it's a multi payment, I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll buy the cash. Um, no matter the um, price. Great. No, I'm just, but I'm just saying like, again, I'm just learning from me. Uh, you know, I, 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 I purchased the property. Purchase this at five fifty in exchange for them selling another property like that. Which was twenty thousand. Uh, the rest I, I I bought cash and uh, I renovated it. And now I am financing that. I'm not financing and getting all my money back. Um, but a good a good chunk. Uh, no. Enough to just know, get you back to. Yeah, you know, it, 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 I don't, I don't over leverage my properties. I don't. What know, What is over leveraging to you? To me, yeah. You know, I mean, all my loans are commercial, so you know, uh, seventy or seventy five percent LTV. Yeah. I don't think it's over leveraging in in every scenario. But I've got properties that are forty percent levered. No, that and makes I'm, more sense. And they're staying like that. Yeah. No, I look. I, I mean, 70, I want, 75 you know, percent makes I've sense. I've got zero dollars of my money in those properties. Yep. Uh, I've got some of the bank's money back on those properties Makes sense. and I'm cash flowing like crazy on them. Um, that's the right. I, way I, I want that because that's the only reason why we buy assets is right for the now, cash flow. Right now the dollar's weak, right? So, yeah. You know, if I borrow the money, I'm paying you know, three and a half, four percent, whatever it is these days. It's so cheap. The money's going to sit in the bank or go to another asset that I'm going to overpay for at this point. Um, but it's still better than being in the bank. I guess. 
So, here, so real quick, just because we're, we're coming up on time, I'm going to go through something called the rapid fire questions, which I literally have asked every single one of my guests. You're just going to you know, quickly answer any one of the questions. So first one, uh, if you had to restart from absolute zero, no connections, no money in the bank, no assets that you have currently. That's how I start. Um, I know that's how you started. If you had to restart today, though, what would be your first three steps to rebuild it? I would save more money. I would only focus on multiple families. And Minimum of two units? Like you're talking two units, uh, and I would scale up into much larger units quicker. So let's talk about that really fast. So, what is much larger to you? Like apartment buildings? Mm -hmm. Like how many units? I I would get myself to the point where 15, 20 unit buildings is your minimum. Yeah, and then once I have a, a multiple view of those, I would trade those up into bigger 40, 50 unit buildings. So talking to me right now, because I, I I you know uh, with the smaller multis that I have. Are you saying that these are too small? No. I mean, baby steps. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna go from two units to to hundred units. No, of course. I'm just there saying, is, but you put a you, process that you have to follow, just for multiple reasons, financial and learning curve. You know, somebody you you, you drop a forty unit building on yourself right now. That's a not, that's a big thing. Know what the hell to do? Just just the underwriting process of something like that, and the management process, and the due diligence process of purchasing something like that is a whole different ballgame. So you think that again? I'll stay, probably stay with the fours and then move up to a twelve or something like that. I'm just saying, like if you're talking like your son right now, I would say never turn the deal down. That makes sense, right? If you got the deal and the opportunity, take it and figure it out later. Um, so that's how I am as a person. Yeah, uh, but there's nothing wrong with you know two, three, four, five unit buildings. You could have a hundred of those. Nothing wrong. I know. And you self manage all of these. Yeah. I know people up in North Jersey that, you know, they've got three, 400 doors and they're all small, multis. small multis. Yeah. No, I, I feel that it's a management nightmare, but I can only, I mean, like the management gets crazy after that. Uh, all right. Next one. I like that. Um, so actually just to repeat, uh, save a lot of money, mm -hmm. get into a multifamily immediately and try to trade up as fast as possible. That's what you want. What and then want. I'm saying for you, and then what's That's the last what one? Do, yeah. And what's the last step? The last step of what I would do differently. Yeah. Not stress so much. Not stress so much. Yeah. Not I like that. Not stress so much. I love that. At the end of the day, everything always works out, and it always works out better. And you know, I need to not catastrophize. That's even a word. Not not everything has to is, is a catastrophe. Not everything you, you don't need to stress about this or that. And, and, and throughout my day, I've got a million issues and a million problems. And um, I worry about every one of them. I mean, I'm staring at the ceiling uh, you know, at one o'clock in the morning. There, there are many nights that I'll look at the ceiling from one to 5.30 when I gotta get up. I don't sleep, but I worry. Um, Thinking what? Stupid stuff that never winds up happening. Just take, so take it easy and don't stress so much. I worry about it. I agree. I love that's, that. That's a lesson I'm currently trying to teach. Myself. Well, I was going to say, speaking of lessons, I have, my next question is a powerful one. So if today was your last day and you had this very moment right now to give some advice to your kids, your family now, your future family, people around you, what would it be? One piece of advice. Don't jinx me. Um, do what makes, oh, first of all, I would, I would talk about I would say, do what makes you happy. Because why are we here? Are we here to make money? Are we here to worry about the nine to five? Are we here to, you know, make sure we get listeners on this podcast? No, no, no. you're here to do what makes you happy. Now, if those things make you happy, then great, you're doing them. But just be happy. I mean, life is too short to, to be or do anything other than happy. I spent 17 years in a, in a job and a career that I just, I miserable. I did well, I, 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 you know, but not what I wanted to do. And just to clarify, just because I, I think it's important for people to hear, would you recommend making the sacrifice for a few years Five years, two years, five years, ten, you know, ten, whatever it is, for somebody where you can make decent money, close your eyes a little bit, 
suck it up, make some good money, save some good money, and get into the investment world? Or would you rather just be happy making 40 grand a year? Success doesn't come with without sacrifice. Right? I agree with that. Um, and, you know, the old adage of learn on somebody else's dime. You know, as much as I, I didn't, you know, as much as I didn't enjoy what I was doing, I wasn't passionate about it. Um, you know, I learned how to think. I learned how to analyze risk at, at these jobs and in this career. I, I, I worked with some of the smartest people in the industry and in the world. Um, and, you know, for that, I am that much smarter. It's not like I was um, changing tires at Mavis in and out all day long, changing tires, changing tires, changing tires. If you're not learning something where you're at, you got to change where you're at. I get that. So, so let's reiterate that. I think, and I agree with you. I think that if you, especially for younger people getting out of college, I think there's a lot of value in working for a company that could educate you to a pretty decent extent, financially, economically, uh, where you're learning these skills where later down the road, they'll be super beneficial. I agree. If you're just going to become a mechanic and you don't want to become a mechanic for the rest of your life, there's sort of no reason for you to be quote unquote changing tires or pumping gas. Uh, but if you can get a really, really good job with a really good person, and I always say try to work as close to the sun as possible, the owner of the business, this is what you can learn from that person directly, even if it meant being their assistant, but at least you can get closer to them and see what they're doing on a daily basis. It's what I've done, and it's allowed me to excel very fast later in life. And it's not so much about the money, but that education is worth a lot of money. So I definitely recommend getting a job, saving good money, work on others, you know, get an education on somebody else's dime. I think that's really powerful. Uh, all right, quick, uh, last quick question. Is there one skill or one habit that you are working on or you feel like has been a game changer in your business that you think that someone else should try to learn for themselves, like a habit or a skill? Well, what, who, um, I think for me in, in my business, whether it's the construction business or the rent business or the development business, Learn how to do the numbers. It's the, it's the math game. That's all it is. I mean, I mean sure, you have, you have to be able to find your deal flow or deal there. That, that in itself is a skill. Um, but you can find it. But learn the numbers. Uh, you know, learn how to, if you want to be a value add landlord or value add buyer to rent properties out. Know what it costs to rewire or replumb or or resheetrock a place. Know those numbers, so you can go into a place. Like I see a lot of these 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 emails come from wholesalers, or these these Facebook posts come from wholesalers. Uh, you know, uh, buy it at a hundred thousand. ARV is is two hundred, and uh, only forty thousand in in renovations. And I know those numbers aren't true because they so they show pictures and you see forty thousand dollars just on roof and siding and windows. So you know, especially now, yeah, they obviously don't know their numbers. So learn how to do the numbers, whether you're running uh, profit and loss uh, uh, models for multifamilies, whether you're you know you're you're running construction estimates for rehabs or multifamilies. Know the numbers. Learn how to do the numbers because it's it's this business. If you take out the deal flowing, how to source deals, this business is really just about simple math. I love buy, that. Buy at X, put in Y, sell for Z. Or buy at X, put in Y, rent for Z. Or re or Z. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think that, you know, luckily I grew up with a father who was a, who was a math teacher. So, you know, I kind of, I didn't realize how much that would actually help me later in life where the only class I did really well in was math. Um, but I think that's really powerful. I think if you want to be a real estate investor to any extent, you need to understand how to run numbers, how to analyze deals. And like you said before, which really hit home for me when you were younger is that you would just look at deal after deal after deal and run a bunch of models. And I've done that so many times before I ever pulled the trigger on a deal because what ends up happening is if you, if you go to a property, for weeks or months or whatever, and you just keep looking at houses and you keep running your models and you can see that, you know, as long as it hits certain metrics, these can be decent deals. At the very beginning, because I was a real estate agent, I would sell them to other people. Other people would get those deals. But now I've done so many of those models when those deals come up, I'm like, wait a second, now I know I can pull that trigger and I can feel very comfortable with it. 
because I feel like if you don't run those models and you don't tour property and you don't understand these processes behind the, behind the curtain really, which is again, knowing your numbers, the whole background, understanding construction costs, you're never going to pull the trigger on a deal. A lot of these people, you know, end up just seeing deal pass by and deal pass by and deal pass by and they never end up pulling the trigger because they don't know their numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, again, for, for a lot of you here who are just looking to get your feet wet in the real estate world, if you don't know your numbers, I feel like it's one, it's one of those very first steps or one habit you should get into is every night, spend a few hours every night running numbers, analyzing deals. You're going to be very grateful down the road that you did that. All right, I'm going to end it with this. For those of you watching here today, uh, and Josh, I'm going to blow up your ego a little bit. This man has known me for quite some time and uh, boy, have I come a long way. That's for sure. But Josh, I <laughs> thank you. But Josh, one thing that I admire about you is that you are more of a man of what you preach than a, a lot of people that I know, you know, saving money, living, living smart and, and banking your money. And I just see every time we talk, I feel like you got a better deal, a bigger deal, a more profitable deal. And it's amazing because again, like I'm 26 and I would hope and pray that I can be where you're at one day. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be surpassed. I appreciate I'm 40, that. I'm, I've, I've got 20 years. I, I'm. So, you know, if I, I was successful at 26, but not in real estate, right? Yeah. I was still trying. Right now, you're 26. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So for those of you watching here today, I want you to take this podcast and listen to it over and over and over again, because there's a lot of golden nuggets in here, specifically if you're looking to get into the investment world. What Josh has done in really a few short years necessarily, and I, I mean, I can't wait to see what you're going to do in the next 20 because it's going to be freaking crazy. Uh, you'll be retired and relaxing on a beach somewhere. My daughter will be running the property. <laughs> drinking something on the beach. Drinking something on the Maybe I'll meet you one of these days. Listen, I, again, rewatch this podcast, take a lot of notes, and make sure you take a lot of action. Make sure you double down on your business. This is a time like never before that you need to be doubling down, saving more money than ever before finding ways to make more money than ever before, eliminate all the distractions like ever before. This is the time because a lot of people look at me like, you know, what I've done has been, you know, crazy or ridiculous in a short period of time. I work a hundred plus hours a week, every week. And I don't waver from that. I listen to people like him and I just take massive levels of action. What you can do in a few short years will be, would blow your mind. If you're, if you're willing to be consistent, driven and focused and determined each and every single day. So again, listen, knowledge without implementation is truly just entertainment. Take what you learned here today and go take massive levels of action. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. And again, listen, thank you so much for listening to episode three of the Step One Podcast. We hope this episode gave you ideas, motivation, and strategies needed so that you can take your first step or your next step in business and in life. Go out there and crush it, guys. I appreciate you, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.